an LED wearable headlight that is currently in vogue on the internet. It's been quite heavily marketed. You can buy it either as the fairly expensive Night Buddy, or you can go online and search for all perspectives induction headlamp and find the generic Chinese unit. Uh, you can also search on eBay for Night Buddy and you also find these. That's probably not going to please the Night Buddy people. So this is it. It's a silicone strap that goes around your head. Not sure how that's going to be from a sweat perspective. And it's got this 40 chip cob and it's also got a little uh, focused light here. And it has several modes. If you click the button once, it goes to full intensity cob mode. Click it again, it goes to 40% intensity. Uh, click it again, it goes to the focused beam at full 100%. And then click it again and it goes at the lower intensity. You'll be glad to know it does not have an SOS function, but I will warn you, it's about to strobe. So just be aware if you have photosensitive disorder, it's about to strobe. I'm holding the button in now and suddenly everything's strobing. Uh, right, I'll stop that. Other functions it has are, if I turn it on at, say, for instance, just to make it more manageable, I'll turn it down to 40%. If you press this button here, the green light lights as well as the red one, and now there's an infrared emitter and sensor here, and when you basically pass your hand by it, it turns it on and off, which is quite a useful feature. I think that's more or less all the features in this. I think that's all the ones I've discovered anyway. The box it comes in says that the cob at 40% should last five hours. I tested it. I fully charged this. Uh, it appears to have a 700 milliamp hour cell it clocked in at 711 milliamp into it and uh, I tested it and it got about four hours it says five hours it got four hours well I, I say four hours I came back four hours later to see how it was doing and it was flickering so it cut out before four hours I'm not sure maybe I'll have to do that test again and see how long it lasts that's assuming it survives this it's, oh, it, oh, it's the flashing. The flashing is eight hours, although both flash. That's odd. It also, the waterproof rating is IPX4. That's quite accurate because, well, I don't think this is waterproof. It has a little flap that covers the battery charging port, but doesn't seem to be that, uh, well, if you've got fingernails, it helps probably, but it doesn't seem to go in as tightly as I'd want. Plus, the bottom is open anyway. And also, oh, actually, I could see the lithium cell tucked in there. And also, this... Uh, in here, I don't know how resilient this is going to be to water and grass. But anyway, uh, is there anything else to say about this? Let's compare it to my current favourite head torch, which also has the infrared function. If you press this button, you can pass your hand in front of it and it cuts in and out. The one advantage of this one is it does look to the side. If you look at MD with high vis on with this, it gets the reflection off the high vis and it turns off, which is quite annoying at times. But normally it's fine. This one is uh, three intensity settings, high, medium, and low. And if you leave it at the, the slight flicker, there was a pulse of modulation. If you leave it at the high setting, after a while, it will gradually nudge down itself to the half setting. Th this is my favorite torch. It's very light. It's completely aimable. This one is not so aimable. It makes up for that by just splashing light everywhere. So I'm going to show you what the light output looks like by putting this on right now, and we can actually compare it to this other light. One moment, please. Okay, let's begin the test in the dark. First mode, 100% cob. And it's not bad, it's not super bright, but it's just splashing light everywhere. I'm looking here, there's light over there and there and there and there. I've never been impressed by cob lights. Maybe it's useful if you want to be seen, but it's not great for working because where you need the light, it's not as bright as it could be. Oh, I can feel my forehead warming up as well. That's nice. Okay, next mode is the reduced one, which is this one. Uh, slight pulse of modulation shimmer. Am I getting that? Not really. The camera is quite sensitive to that, but it's, it's on the verge of being, I mean, you'd find your way about, I guess, here, but it's not that great, right? Next mode is the beam. Now, this is the focused beam. There is a problem. Right. Imagine I'm working on here. Um, so I'm working down here. The light is up there, like really like light up. The light is so far up there that to actually work in that, I'd have to put my hands up like this and look out the top of my eye socket, so to speak. It's not 
uh, great for working with in that sense. And if I look into the distance, it does create a useful beam, but it's not great for close-up work. And again, it's going to cut out and then in again. One moment. Uh, down to the lower setting. Again, because, well, it's aiming the same direction. I'm just looking away from the... It's useful for general illumination, but it's not great for actually focusing on, right? Now I'll get my other light. Here is my other light. I'm working here. The natural position for the eyes is actually just slightly higher, but because it doesn't go down all the way, but it's very easy without straining your eyes to get where you want to be. I have a look here. I can point the beam of light here. It's great for working. Uh, when I choose the lower intensity setting, this one, um, any pulse of modulation? Oh, there's a little pulse of modulation ripple. Still good light, uh, and that's especially useful because it does cut down to this intensity after a time, after you've had it up full. And if you it's too dark, you can just turn it off and on again. It will reset. And then even at the low setting, the lowest setting of all, which has that slight ripple, you're seeing the sort of rolling shutter effect, that's still, uh, that's on a par, to be honest, with the cob on the other one where it's just splashing light everywhere. But in this case, it's using ultra low energy and it's concentrating on the light here. So I would say, no, it's not gonna replace this little light anytime soon. One moment, please, the light is coming back. So yes, it looks a great light. It, I mean, the advertising makes it look fantastic for working in things. When it comes to the crunch, I prefer this simple light which I think may actually use a similar LED chip. Now, other things about this before I take it apart. When you turn it on, uh, it remembers the last mode. So say, for instance, I've got on full cob at the moment. If I click the button again, it goes to the lower setting. But if I go around to the start again, if I click it, put it onto the full, and then leave it for several seconds as though I'm working with it, as though I'm using it, when I turn and press the button again, it will turn straight off. This is good. And when you press it again, it will turn straight on at the last setting. That's a nice feature. Let me just step through the modes and then we shall take it apart. Now, I initially thought this was for comfort, this band, but now I'm beginning to think that this is how they actually manufacture the light. So let's peel this off. Oh, there is actually. There is uh, a couple of wires that I have to take off here. Right, tell you what, I'm just gonna pause while I desolder those. One moment, please. The cob is out, and uh, I've put a bit of captain tape over the wires to stop them shorting together during my exploration. So I would guess now that I'm really just wanting to peel this thing out of here. Oh, actually, that uh, little battery cap thing is going to have to come out. Where's my spudger? Spudger. And pop it out. That's actually fitting better than my previous attempts to put it in. So let's get it out like this, revealing a little vague plastic box and the wires. Okay. Do we have any screws? No, it looks like it clips together. Let's zoom down in this so we can explore it together. And I'll make sure that I am actually recording. Yes, I am. That's good. Sometimes I lose sync when I'm starting and stopping recording. So it charges about 500 milliamps, which is reasonable enough for what appears to be a 700 milliamp hour cell. Not overly keen on those solder connections being right above that cell. Well, they are on the borderline of actually pushing against that. That's not nice. Maybe worth checking that if you get one of these. So I shall do a bit of reverse engineering in this, I think. Well, there's the uh, main LED, the focused LED, should I say, with its little heat sink. That's quite neat. Right, tell you what, I'm just going to take a picture of this. I'll be back in one moment. The picture has been taken. Let's zoom in and explore this circuitry. So we have the USB connector on the other side here, and it's going straight to this 17R chip, which is the charge control chip. It's got 4057 next to it, and the pinout does indeed match the TP4057 LTC4057 generic mass cloned 4057 which is a charge control chip. That has one resistor to set the charge current at the 500 milliamps. It's got one very ungenerous, one output capacitor going to the lithium uh, cell and to the directly to the chip. It's worth mentioning the lithium cell does have extra protection circuitry. It's got the DW01 style circuit board on it. 
There are a couple of buttons that pull pins directly to the zero volt rail. These LEDs are being driven directly without resistors on the chip, suggesting it's got current limited outputs or just basically low, uh, low output current. They're not really buffered up that much. And on the same basis, they're driving the MOSFETs here directly because there's two MOSFETs driving the beam and the cob via one ohm resistors each. If there's any difference in current, I didn't measure the current. I should have done that before I took it all apart. Um, the beam, it's a single LED and it's being driven quite hard, so its voltage is going to be higher. So for that one ohm, it's going to be a sort of lower current than this one, where it's driving the cob, where it's got 40 LEDs in parallel to share the current. So their voltage isn't going to go quite so high, and therefore the uh, there's going to be more current in the cob circuit. This is infrared emitter driven by this transistor. This is infrared receiver and this circuitry had me perplexed. It took me a while to reverse engineer that. So if you want to analyze this yourself, here's the component side of the circuit board. And here is the back of the circuit board. Noting that the USB-C socket just has six connections. The two data lines are tied together. Uh, the two positives are tied together and the two negatives are tied together. Uh, there are no resistors to tell a intelligent device that's putting out USB to USB-C uh, to tell it to actually even put out current. So if you have a problem with charging this unit from uh, intelligent modern chargers, you may want to just go for the lead that's supplied with it and plug it into a straightforward, just standard, dumb USB power bank to charge it or power supply. Right, bring on the schematic and we shall analyse it. I have divided this into two sections because it's made it easier. Two sections and then I did another doodle because uh, it, uh, one bit was quite complex. So here's the USB coming in, goes straight to the 4057 chip. There it's its programming resistor going to the zero volt rail, little decoupling capacitor going to the zero volt rail for stability. There's the lithium cell with its protection circuit. The 3 to 4.2 volts from that lithium cell goes straight out to power everything at that point. Uh, these two lines, the red and the green one, are actually the signals from this chip that pull to the zero volt rail. So they're being pulled up internally to the positive rail very gently by the processor and it can see the green when it's actually putting a charge into the lithium cell and then when the output changes to the red one uh, being pulled to the zero volt rail, the microcontroller can then say it's charged and change the LED status accordingly. Two buttons going to the zero volt rail, two LEDs with no resistors going to the zero volt rail. The MOSFETs being driven, they've got a 10k pull down resistor on the gate of each MOSFET. They're A2 SHB MOSFETs, very standard. And because ultimately I guess there is high impedance outputs, they're, they're being driven directly from the outputs of the microcontroller. That is the bulk of it, but you'll notice there's two lines going up to the infrared module. Let me show you what's happening here. There should actually be three lines going up to the infrared module. Yes, right, okay, I'll draw the third line in. The perplexing infrared module. The emitter is easy. There's a 3.3K resistor driving a PNP transistor 2TY, and there's a 1.5 ohm resistor in series of the infrared LED. And when the infrared feature is enabled, it will be pulsing that at a fairly high frequency, uh, just to, I, I think it's going to be pulsing it. Yes, it will be pulsing it, because there is a capacitor over there, right? So it, it is pulsing infrared to get sort of high output, and also to avoid disturbance from... Uh, ambient infrared illumination, it will be filtering out and the receiver circuit will be filtering out those pulses so it knows that is what it's receiving. This is a bit that had me perplexed. There's another identical 2TY PNP transistor and it is configured as a amplifier. So you've got the positive rail goes to the a potential divider based on this 10K resistor and the photodiode detector. Notice it, the direction it is. And I guess that this is the enable line that powers circuitry up, and this is the signal back from it. And this is where I've actually redrawn it on the next page, because I think it's clearer uh, to do that. But the main thing is the enable line means that when the infrared function is not required, or if the unit is sleeping, it can uh, leave that, it can make it high impedance, or even take it to the positive rail, and it will effectively 
turn this whole section off. Uh, and the signal back is just uh, monitoring the signal back from the amplifier. Let me just change the page here because I've redrawn it as if it's just permanently connected. So imagine this is the plus volt line and this is the zero volt line which is actually being switched to the processor. We've got the potential divider here, then any alternating signal from this, because effectively the voltage will be fluctuating as it receives the pulses of infrared as you put your hand up to the unit and reflect. It reflects off your hand back onto the sensor. It gets coupled via this capacitor to the input of this transistor. Now this transistor is a P-channel, BNP transistor, and it's being biased towards the, it's, the positive rail with this 3.3k resistor, which kind of keeps it turned off. However, uh, it has a feedback resistor. 470k seems quite high, actually. It's quite odd that. Had me double checking. 474, 470k. 474 series. Uh, but that is a negative feedback uh, resistor, which just gently biases the transistor so it starts turning on. Uh, but provides a sort of feedback, so it gives it a specific gain. And that's amplifying the pulses uh, that are being coupled through this capacitor. The transistor effectively has a bias resistor. It forms part of a divider with this 10k resistor to the zero volt rail. And uh, when it's getting the signal, the voltage here will be fluctuating. This sort of feedback uh, resistor will be limiting that to degree, but you'll basically get an amplified signal out here. A series of pulses uh, and this 3.3k resistor then goes to the processor. And that is it. So interesting light. It doesn't look too bad a design. It's interesting to note that it's obviously evolved enough that they're comfortable enough to put the component values on the circuit board. Uh, noting that that component value, I'm not sure what that value is there, but uh, I don't think that one is the same value. I wonder if that was 200k. It's a big splodge. That's a shame. But even the 1 ohm resistors are marked. Oh no, that's actually, that's the transistor number 2302. Uh, it would have been better if I'd turned this upside down since everything is that way. But they've also marked it 2TY there. And no, that's the uh, 2302 is actually the MOSFET number. So that, that resistor there, I think the reason they've not marked this one in... Oh, they, they've marked that one as 474. Why? That's the one that's going back. Oh, no. no. They, that one is referring to that, and that one is referring to that. That's, that's not clear. It's just the way they've done it to avoid the clutter there. Well, they've made it cluttered. But they have actually marked on the, all the component values then. That's interesting. It does suggest they've refined the, the design right to the point they feel comfortable doing that. That also means that's potentially. Is that 10 microfarad? Hard to see what that is. It's very splodgy. But, um... Yeah, it's it's an interesting little light. Um, I'm not sure how hot this is going to get in use on your forehead. I suppose your forehead makes a splendid heat sink because it's got that flow of blood through it all the time. And uh, yeah, the the battery, the lithium cell, it actually says it's 800 milliamp hour. Now, I could was only able to put 700 milliamp hour in it. Unless it cut off early on the unit, maybe the processor cut it off early. Don't know. Or maybe it's just because it's not been charged and discharged enough to actually get up to its full capacity yet because the chemistry tends to realign uh, as it, you know, get it gets conditioned. It just alters the chemistry a little bit as it's used. But 2.96 watt hour, 800 milliamp hour. So that's a fairly decent cell. Uh, hackability. You could potentially change if you wanted the 1 ohm resistors for something a bit higher if you wanted to lengthen battery life. But having said that, um, I'm not super thrilled at this. I mean, people, everybody has their own idea of what a good head torch is like. This might appeal to some people who just want a more visible splash of light around them. But I still prefer my uh, focused beam that I'm going to be working on. This is the same one I use at work. Uh, this little dinky one. But that's it. Internally, the circuitry is not too bad. So it really is all down to whether you like that style of light or not, but it's very well built.